Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Molino, Managing Director of Just Capital, and we're delighted to welcome you to our latest quarterly Just Call. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Tom Layton, the CEO of Akamai Technologies, and my colleague, Martin Whitaker, the CEO of Just Capital. Hopefully, many of you caught the segment that just wrapped up on CNBC, and if not, stay tuned. We'll share it in a recap next week. A few housekeeping notes, uh, sorry, housekeeping notes before we get started. You should see a presentation up on your screen if you're logged in to the Entrada web platform. The call today is going to be being recorded. You're able to hit replay it later on demand, and we'll also feature it later on Just Capital's website. All, cap all callers are going to be on mute, so please feel free to pose a question to both Tom and Martin using the webcast platform. You'll see a module to the left side of your screen. We're going to do our best to get through as many of the questions as we can at the end of this call. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Martin. Take it away. Thanks, Michelle. Good morning, everybody. And a huge thank you to you, Tom, for joining us today. Um, it's been great to get to know you and your company uh, in more detail and to meet you in person. Um, you know, I think the scale of your impact um, is enormous. For those of you that don't know, about 85% of web traffic flows through Akamai's infrastructure. Um, we are going to walk through all the good things that Akamai is doing across the five stakeholder areas that Just Capital uh, tracks companies on and learn a lot more sort of behind the scenes what is uh, what is happening at Akamai and Tom's thinking um, about those issues and more importantly, the business case, you know, why these things matter to investors. Um, I know there are some uh, folks on the call who are new to Just Capital, so I'm just going to say a few words of introduction about Just, and then we'll uh, turn to Tom. So just by way of background, um, you know, Just Capital is here to measure how companies perform on the priorities of the American people, and we do that by really tracking stakeholder performance. Um, we track the largest 1,000 publicly traded companies in America across all of those things. The purpose of this call is really to provide a venue, a forum for leading CEOs to talk directly to uh, business and investor communities about all the good things that they're doing. Um, what you see on slide four are the five stakeholder groups, um, how a company treats its workers, its customers, the communities where it operates, its impact on the environment, and of course, its uh, relationship with its shareholders and how well it's governed. The numbers you see there are the relative importance to the American people in, in aggregate. Um, we sample a representative sampling of, of the American population, but of course, there are people who care about different things differently. And so um, many of you on the call might be interested in one of these themes, and that's totally fine. This presents a full picture of how uh, the nation as a whole uh, thinks about corporate performance today. Um, just to highlight on the next slide, the Just 100. These are the top 100 companies overall, of which Akamai is a part. These companies pay their median workers 30% more money, pay a living wage to more of their workers. They give more uh, away to charity. They have more women on their boards. Um, and they're also... Uh, more profitable. They have a 6% higher return on equity. And as we'll see later, they have higher operating margins and high valuations in the market. Um, we are our flagship index, which is on the next slide, has outperformed its benchmark by around 450 basis points in live trading since inception. And, uh, you know, we're pretty proud of the fact that that we think that this is a business issue, an investor uh, uh, issue, as well as a template for how to run a successful company today. And you can see that with Akamai's performance in the next slide um, over the same period. So with that, I'm just going to ask you, Tom, maybe just at a very high level, it looks to us as though your values and the way you run your company, the driving shareholder value, of course. Could you just talk a little bit about your philosophy, your ideology as it relates to these issues? 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, the stakeholders that are focused on by Just Capital are critical uh, to creating long-term successful company and driving shareholder value. Our employees are our most important asset. Uh, it's been that way from day one. And uh, we work really hard to create a strong, positive culture, great workplace, a uh, place where people want to come and give their best every day. Uh, and so you really, it's very important to treat your workers fairly uh, in terms of the whole package, the whole experience. Um, obviously, customers are hugely important. That's, they're the ones you know, paying the revenue. Uh, we always say at Akamai that uh, customers are number one. Everything we do is really for the benefit of the customer, whatever it takes to solve their problems and help them be successful in their businesses. Community is, is critical. Uh, of course, that's where our employees come from. It's who we interact with. Um, you know, and we embark on special programs that give back to the community, both in terms of money and also volunteerism and training programs to help uh, train people that want to have a career in tech but don't have the skill set yet. Hmm. Uh, environment, uh, you know, I think that's an important problem even at a macro level, you know, beyond a, a company. You know, we have serious challenges ahead with the environment. And increasingly, and I think as a result of the kinds of things that Just Capital does, there's more recognition of that in business. And now we actually have customers that want to know, uh, you know, how are we tracking on sustainability? What are our goals? Uh, and it makes a difference in terms of who they decide to do business with. And that's a good, good thing. Uh, so now it's even more directly tied into business, I, I would say. Uh, and of course, shareholders, they own the company. Uh, but I think all of these things really are important to driving long-term shareholder value, uh, which is what we're all about at Aqua. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Could you just give us a glimpse as the CEO with, and within the C-suite and the board, how do you track this stuff? How do you, what framework do you use? What, what are some of the metrics? How do you think about measuring performance in these areas the same way you'd measure performance in? Financial matters. Yeah, Akamai is a very uh, highly technical company, and a lot of our employees are very technical. So we have metrics for everything. Uh, you know, metrics for employee satisfaction, happiness. Uh, do they feel included? Uh, just anything you could imagine. We're we're tracking metrics for. Obviously, customer happiness. What do we? What are the areas we need to do better to make our customers happier? Uh, you know communities, uh, the environment, you know, how much uh, use, inc are we increasing the amount of energy we consume? What kind of energy are we consuming? You know, is it renewable or, or damaging? Yeah. Uh, so there's just a zillion metrics we track, and we have mission-critical goals for the company every year, uh, also longer-term goals for things especially around the environment. Those tend to be longer term targets that are put in place, and we track how we're doing. We're going to drill down into some of those areas in a second. Um, so maybe just uh, what you can see here is uh, Akamai's performance um, and your leadership on all five of these stakeholder areas. Um, maybe let's just drill down into the first of those, the workers, which as I know is something very important to you. So we're on slide uh, nine overall. Um, you're a leader when it comes to creating a very supportive workplace that offers great benefits uh, and an array of work-life balance programs and policies that focus on employee health and well-being, and presumably this helps you attract and retain top talent. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Why do you invest so heavily in your workforce? Uh, well, yeah, as I mentioned before, the workforce it is the most important part of the company. Um, you know, we have technology, but that technology is created by the workforce. Uh, the operations and services we provide are created by the workforce. And it makes a big difference if your workforce is motivated and, you know, wanna, they want to come to work and give their best. That you have an inclusive environment where everybody feels comfortable talking about their ideas. That's how you get innovation. Uh, diversity, obviously very important. Diversity of thought. Uh, you know, so, it, and, and we, we always talk about it internally that 
and it's not just recently or anything to do with with this survey, but that from day one, you know, our employees are the most, you know, powerful thing that Akamai has, and that mm -hmm. is what will drive our future growth. Have you found that, uh, and you know, over the years you've been at the helm, how those things might have changed? You know, do you find that, you know, uh, new folks entering the industry in order to attract them? you know, you're having to change policies? How has that sort of shifted over the years? You know, I think at the high level with the principles, they haven't changed. The details evolve and continue to, you know, uh, best practices get better. Uh, you know, I think when we started the company, you know, over 20 years ago, it, it was really hard to think about environmental sustainability and and getting alternative sources of power. The infrastructure wasn't really there to accommodate that. You know, we we worked on reducing the amount of power we consume per movie we deliver or per banking transaction that we support. So we always worked on that. But over time, there's it's the infrastructure is there now where you can talk about uh, you know actually having a large fraction of your power come from renewable resources in a way that really makes sense you know, for the environment as a whole. And that continues to get better. Um, and I think at the beginning, maybe there were one or two companies, you know, in Scandinavia that cared. Uh, and now I think it's much more pervasive in terms of the customer base. I think in the beginning, I don't know that any shareholders, you know, would, would ask a question about it, maybe a couple, but today a significant fraction of the base wants to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, so I'd say the overall environment is becoming much more aware. It's becoming more important. And I think, you know, just uh, capital plays an important role in that part of the education. And by the way, this really increases your shareholder value so that the investors should care. Thank you. Um, so let's just dwell a little bit on, on one specific element of your investment in your workforce, which is on parental leave. Um, you You really are a standout in our analysis among not just the your your competitors in the tech sector and the internet sector but across the entire Russell 1000 our universe of companies um you, you know you, you've invested heavily in family friendly benefit um daycare services parental leave flexible work schedules could you just talk a little bit about um how those issues have impacted your employees lives and do you, how do you how do you sort of view that in terms of um, you know creating a workforce that is highly engaged? Everybody you know we we know that an engaged employee is so much more productive and the business case is clear and very strong. Just give us a glimpse again as to sort of how how you view that and how as a company you manage that and continually manage to improve and invest in those areas. Yeah, I, you know at Akamai we're in this for the, the long haul and. Uh, you know, as part of that, we want employees to stay with us, you know, for a long period of time. Now, in tech, you do have a bit of a phenomenon that employees tend to move on to different companies every two or three years. And, you know, I don't think that's that's good for the company. And so if we can create, you know, benefits or practices that encourage an employee to want to be with us for a long time, you know, in their career. At Akamai, that's good, and so this is you know family leave is, I think just good for the employee and and in general. But employees that really benefit from that are more loyal to the company, uh, and they will you know deliver more value, uh, you know to shareholders over the long term. So you look at it and say, well, wow, that employee is now because you know they're not there. You gave them a long leave. Isn't that bad for shareholders? You certainly miss the employee when they're not there. But if you look at this over the long haul picture, no, you've just created a lot of value. Uh, in fact, I remember just you know personal anecdote, you know taking a parental leave myself when our first child was born, and uh, I, we didn't have Akamai then, uh, but uh, my wife was uh, trying to get tenure in, at an academic institution, which is really a hard thing. And but we needed we wanted you know to have a family and the timing you know was was there and uh, so we we tried to do both and fortunately you know where I worked you know you had paternal leave you know which I took 
hardest job I ever had, you know, <laughs> but uh, made a huge difference, you know, you know, to me and to our family to be able to do that. And a wonderful experience, you know, in that case, you know, basically taking many months off to be a primary caregiver. So, so the long-term view, the long-term investment in your employees pays yeah. off. Do you, do you get any pushback from investors? Do you ever get any resistance to the investments you're making in your workforce? I guess if you're a successful, you know, financially, then, you know, that sort of that that's all the answer you need to give. But could you, yeah. you know, has there been any dynamic around that? No pushback, because mm -hmm. I think the investors who would push back really are just much more focused on the, the core near-term financial and uh, not thinking about the details behind that. Uh, so never any pushback, oh, hey, you're, you're giving more parental leave or family leave than most companies. I've never heard that. Now, some of our investors who do care about these things would look at that detail and say, oh, that's, that's a good thing. Um, but never, so never any specific negative feedback. But increasing support from long-term oriented yeah. investors. I, you know, I would say the uh, over time the share, the number of shareholders who care about these these just uh, issues has grown. And uh, you know, I think the the index funds increasingly care about that and will ask questions about it. The long-term shareholders increasingly recognize this is important. That the culture of a company is important. And so I will see more questions, you know, from the long-term shareholders about this. I'd say the short-term holders and more the short-term hedge funds doesn't come up, generally speaking, and they're more focused on the, the near term. Mm -hmm. Let's just switch gears then and move on to customers, which obviously is, you know, a crucial stakeholder. Uh, you rank first in industry on many of the metrics we measure uh, across the customer category. Um, especially as it relates to protecting customer privacy and security. And I know this is a big issue for your company. We talked a little bit about this earlier. Could you just elaborate a little bit on what customer privacy means to Akamai, investing in, in that, how you measure that, and where you see that's going? Yeah, keeping customer and user data private. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, and secure. And this is really uh, topical now when you see things like elections being manipulated, uh, user data being stolen for commercial gain. Uh, it's a big deal. Now, laws beginning to be passed. Uh, you have GDPR in Europe, CCPA in California. There'll be more states that have laws enacted to make sure that user data is not used for things that the user doesn't want it used at a high level and that it's not. Stolen, uh, and since we carry a large fraction of all the commercial transactions and a lot of the media and engagement, it's really important for us to keep that data private, not to use it for advertising, not to sell it to third parties. The only way we'll we'll leverage that data is for security, in terms of what entities out there are doing bad things. You know, trying to steal something, attacking something, corrupting something, um, and that's the only way we would use user data. Uh, and in fact, we're actually selling services to our our enterprise customers today to help them keep the data they have secure, keep it private, not to you know use it for things the customer hasn't allowed to support user opt-in capabilities, opt-out capabilities. Increasingly, laws will say that a user has the right to know what information you're keeping about me. You know, that's really hard for enterprises today. It costs them a lot of money and effort to answer that. Having a service where we can do that in basically real time and uh, help our enterprise customers respect the laws to stay compliant. And it's hard for a global company today because there's different laws in all the countries and now states. And you know, first it was GDPR, or one of the first was GDPR, and even companies trying to do the right thing now getting huge, hit with huge fines. You know, a major airline, you know, with uh, a quarter billion dollar fine because they got hit with an attack and it exposed their user data. And so we are providing services now to help other enterprises, you know, be safe. Be and you see that as a big growth area for I 2020 do. and beyond. I do, because it's so important. And the 
Attacking entities are so powerful, well-funded, highly motivated. Uh, it's, uh, it's, and they're way ahead. And so it's our job to try to give, provide services to help enterprises that want to do the right thing to be able to do the right thing. Um, we've noticed in our polling and survey work that um, wherever we go, this issue is becoming more and more important. It's, it's increased in its weighting in our model. Um, it's an explicit category that we measure now because we hear this in our focus groups. We see we, we hear this from from uh, from from you know respondents, um, and not just in with regards to their data, but but their overall experience as a customer. How how do they feel as though the company's investing in their well-being, you know, their engagement, um, B2C and B2B. Um, so I think that's a huge area of advantage for you and, and an area where you wouldn't necessarily think of this as being a sort of ESG issue. Mm -hmm. This is about a core business issue. Um, so uh, maybe shifting gears again, let's talk a little bit about communities now. Um, so we measure lots of things in this area, human rights standards in the supply chain and how companies support local communities where they operate. Um, Akamai performs very, very well in supporting community growth and development, um, especially your commitment to education, um, to having strong veteran diversity supplier policies. Could you just talk a little bit about the community uh, category for you, Tom, and uh, why you think that's critical to your overall success? Well, the community is where your your workforce lives. Uh, it's where you get your workforce from. Um, it's so obviously it's very important. And uh, you know, so at, at Akamai, we we have a foundation that uh, provides funding for uh, efforts to have better education. Uh, and it's, we have it focused on the locations where our employees live, and we do it in conjunction with employee engagement. Uh, so it's not a blind kind of foundation, but where employees want to engage with the community to, to do some good through education or to help underprivileged you know, uh, groups advance, uh, this is where we apply our funding to help that happen. Uh, and there's not just money, but also personal engagement. Uh, and, you know, so we encourage employees and we set up structured activities in the cities around the world where we have offices to do community service activities and to give back. Uh, many of them focused around education, but also it can really be anything, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I participated in one, you know, recently in Cambridge where we have our headquarters, had nothing to do with, with technology or education, but I got to tell you, everybody feels really good doing this, and you do it with other employees, and it's a it's a great bonding experience. And um, yeah, okay, so that day we we weren't directly working as much, but it, I think you probably over the course of the year there's more productivity as a result. So maybe just elaborate on that a little bit. You know, we often think about these things as being separate from you know the serious business of, of a company. But yet we see companies investing more and more of their time and resources in in these efforts because you know they feel like it's making them better overall, and this is now becoming increasingly important to how they engage their employees, as you said. Talk a little bit about the business benefit of this kind of investment. Yeah, well, like I think it goes from direct, maybe not the next day. Uh, to, you know, a longer, you know, payback. I think of programs that we support, like Girls Who Code, uh, is a fabulous experience for the employees that engage in that. Uh, you know, we've been hosting programs in a couple of our offices for a while now. Uh, now, you know, it'll be a while before any of those girls grow up to women and work for us, you know. <laughs> but um, we're making a, a difference. It's small because we're not that huge a company, but we're impacting their lives. You know, that these girls come in and spend the summer and our employees, you know, train them, they learn, they do cool stuff. They, you know, learn all about the technology around the internet and the web. 
Uh, and the, our employees that take the time to do it, I think, benefit greatly. And the FMI Technical Academy as well? And that's a fantastic program where, you know, we'll train for six months. We do training for uh, college-educated people, but they know nothing about technology. Mm -hmm. But they've decided they want a career in tech. Uh, so we will train them and pay them because they can't afford to get training, many of them, because they've got to have an income. Uh, train them for six months, and then they'll have an internship for six months in a role at Akamai. Uh, and then after that time, uh, they're ready to take a job at Akamai. And our uh, our rate at doing that is 95%. Hmm. It's been very successful. And now we've been doing it long enough that we can project how those new employees do compared to the rest of the pool of new employees. And they're doing great in terms of, you know, the success in their role, the roles, advancement later into more roles. They're among our best uh, recruits. Even though they, a year before they got the job, they didn't know anything about the technology. Uh, so we've been thrilled with that program. We now do it, I think, in three or four cities around the world. Uh, it's, it's, and it's increasing, it's focused on diversity, if that yeah. wasn't clear. Uh, you know, so I would say most of the students are women. Um, and there's also diversity in terms of, you know, ethnic background, uh, veterans are, you know, yeah. part of the program, uh, and diversity is, is really important. And in tech, you know, it's, it's challenging because the base population you're recruiting from is, is not diverse. And this is a way to help the, the overall base population become more diverse. Now, again, we're a drop in the bucket, uh, but it's, it's been great as a program. I love that story. Um, it's it's what we do. It's a living example of what Just Capital is all about. And uh, you know, you're addressing not just an issue that's I think relevant to Akamai, but to the tech sector overall. Yeah. Um, and I think that's going to become more important over time too. Um, do we have time just to talk about the environment very quickly? Akamai. Well, a lot of people don't really realize necessarily is what huge power consumers. Um, uh, tech companies can be, and so that's why there's a, such a strong focus on resource efficiency, uh, renewable energy, and overall environmental management within the tech sector. Um, it's not obvious to people that that's the case. Could you talk a little bit about that? I know you've, with your growth, has also come substantial growth in power consumption. So how have you squared that with your goals on the environment and clean energy? Yeah, you'd. People don't really think about Akamai at all because we're under the covers, the plumbing of the internet. Uh, but when you watch a movie or you buy something online, uh, you check your bank balance, very good chance that the device you're doing that with is talking to one of our devices. And we have quarter million servers in a thousand cities around the world, and you don't see it, you don't think about it, but it's consuming power. Uh, and at our scale, doing so much traffic and supporting so many applications, that adds up. And so that's an area where we, we can make a difference. It's important for us to be working to decrease the amount of power we consume. Uh, and then when we do consume power, to try to get more and more of it from renewable resources. And so we've had a major effort there. And we're really, you know, for a long time, we're proud of the progress we're making. You know, we've tripled the amount of traffic that we deliver, roughly speaking, over the past few years, but our energy usage has stayed flat. And that's a lot of energy still, but we didn't triple it. And uh, that's because of the great work that our teams have done of making our software more efficient. Uh, now, of course, we also get financial benefit there. If we're, we're losing using less energy, we're spending less mm -hmm. for it. And so it's direct translation to shareholder value. And then of the energy we're, we are using, we had a long-term goal to next year get it to be half that's renewable, and we're close to that. Uh, you know, one of our providers has had some delays, and so we're looking at alternatives. Like, how do we really, really get there? So that one's, I would say, close. Yep, yep, that's great. Again, a good example of setting a target um, on a big issue, not just for you, but for the space. Okay, so I think we're now getting close to Q&A time. Um, uh, Tom, thanks for elaborating on all of that. I think it's a wonderful story. Um, I'm going to hand back to Michelle to walk us through the Q&A section of the poll.
Fantastic. Thank you both. So we've received some questions both through the SAFE platform prior to the call, as well as several questions coming in through the platform today. The first question I'll ask is, you know, how, how has being a part of the Just 100 really changed Akamai's commitment just regarding ESG? I don't think it's, it's changed our commitment. And, you know, we've had a commitment in these areas since we started the company over 20 years ago. Uh, I think, you know, it does just 100 makes a difference in the community as a whole, and it increases awareness, uh, and that's, that's a good thing. I think there's, you know, you could say there's a, some additional benefit to a company like Akamai because as awareness increases, shareholders become more, more aware that, hey, this is important to how the company is going to do over the long term financially, uh, and that's helpful, I think. Uh, you know, because at the end of the day, the shareholders own the company. And so having them be more aware that these things are important is a, is a good thing. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, the next question really kind of shifts to an area we haven't talked so much about, which is around jobs and job growth. And the question came in around, does Akamai plan to hire more in the U.S.? Uh, we are a growing uh, company uh, and a growing global company. Now, today... Uh, mo a lot of our revenue growth is in Asia, and so a lot of our job growth is in Asia. But we are continuing to grow in the United States. Uh, most of our employees are here, uh, and our headquarters is here. So we do anticipate future job growth in the U.S. And sort of pivoting back to where we were just sort of talking about in terms of ESG concerns and the business case, and you know, how, how do you really think about evaluating the ROI of being just or, or thinking about these just issues? I think it really depends on the particular program that you're looking at. Uh, you know, so deciding on renewable energy and what your target's going to be, the ROI calculations there are very different than the Akamai Technical Academy and how many students you're going to enroll and the costs associated with that. So each of these areas, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, we're a very metric company and we look at those things very carefully, but they're all very different depending on the program. Can, can I just jump in and ask on that, could you just talk a little bit about the long-term nature of some of these issues? Because I, I, I think measuring ROI on things like, you know, investing in paid time off for your workforce is obviously very complicated, but how do you think about in terms of the return on that over you know many years, let's say? Yeah, that's a that's a you know multi-year horizon, and and even you know there, and that gets measured by I would say more employee engagement and how your employees are feeling, what our attrition rates are, uh, you know, and by having these programs, your attrition rates are lower, your employees are more engaged. There's a direct cost you can tie to attrition, you know, which is the time it takes to train and onboard a new employee. Uh, you know, engagement's a little harder. You know, we, we know our, our scores and we track them, but how do you translate that into dollars? That's a little trickier, uh, you know, to do. So it's not all perfectly precise. Do you, do you feel over time there'll be more disclosure from companies on a, on a standardized basis on some of those things? Oh, I think so. I think that has been increasing over time. Um, you know, I will companies publish their engagement scores. We certainly talk about it internally. We tell that our entire company, and of course, once you're up to 8,000 people, probably, you know, at that point, nothing's really secret. Um, so we, you know, at Akamai, we tend to share with our employee base is what we do. And we don't publish a vast amount of statistics externally, generally. I think the trend is, I agree with you towards that. I, I imagine I'm going to lay a bet that five years from now you will be publishing those numbers because I think it's a competitive advantage. <laughs> oh, that, well, that could be. You've got a point there. You know, if outsiders see the engagement scores and happy employees, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Definitely data. We'd love to get more. Yeah. Before yeah. We want to reflect it. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think we just have time for maybe one last question. How does Akamai weigh their responsibility to act ethically versus your responsibility to generate profit for shareholders? And specifically, could you perhaps talk about a time when you had to make a difficult decision in the last year? Well, you know, ethics are very important for us. Uh, and, you know, it's something we're constantly, you know, working on and thinking through. And 
course, any company that has 8,000 employees in uh, well, dozens of countries, you know, 65 offices around the world, uh, you know, different countries have different cultures and approaches to things, you know, that uh, than we would have here. It's complicated, and we go to a lot of effort around training uh, of ethics, and in some cases, what might be okay or considered Maybe it's not considered okay, but it's common practice in certain parts of the world. Extra training that that's not how Akamai is going to operate. And in some cases, you know, it does come at a cost. You know, if you want something done fast in some places of the world, well, there's ways that's that's they do that that we're not going to do. <laughs> you know, and then it can be slower for us to get something done. But that's just the way it's going to be. And in, in the end, we feel that's the best approach you know, for the company, the right thing to do. Just like uh, customer data privacy leapt up yeah. in the way so did um, ethical oh, le yeah. leadership this year. We saw that pop uh, in 2019. Yeah, the data we have, you know, all those folks that talk about data, we have all that put together. <laughs> you know? And, yeah, you can say, wow, that that's a gold mine, you know, if you monetize that. Yeah, but no way we're going to, because it's, no, because you, you do that, you won't have the data for very long, and you'll run afoul of just everything. It's just, there's no way you want to go down that slippery slope. Well, um, Tom, I just want to thank you again. Akamai really is uh, a leader when it comes to a stakeholder-driven company. Thank you for your leadership and for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Uh, thank you to everybody who joined the call. Thank you to our partners at CNBC, NASDAQ, uh, Intrado, and Say. Um, please tune in on Friday, January 17th, when we'll be doing our next call with Antonio Neri, the CEO of HPE. Great. Well, thank you very much.